stupid thing. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is time for us to get started. So glad everyone is here this morning. And I know everybody is good and awake from all the muffins and coffee they've had this morning, right? So well, let's, let's begin our time of study by going to God in prayer. If you would bow with me. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today, and we thank you for this time that we have to be here, and we thank you for this book, our Bibles, your Bible, that we get to study this morning. Lord, we thank you for the prophet Malachi, and we thank you for the things that he wrote. We thank you for the men and women who have made sure that we get to read that today in our language and in the comfort of this room. We ask for you to help us to remember how blessed we are to have that privilege to read your word like we're about to this morning. And Lord, as we open the words of the prophet this morning, we pray for wisdom, we pray for discerning, and we pray for right judgment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing on our study through the prophet Malachi. And this is a Perhaps a book, maybe you're like me. When you heard you were going to have a class on Malachi, you thought, man, I've, I've never actually studied Malachi before. And that, that was my experience, too, when Jeff said, hey, would you like to teach a class on Malachi? So it's, it's been an interesting study for me, and I hope it's been an interesting study for you. Last week, we talked about who the priests were. We talked about their special duties and their special restrictions. And the priest had lost this heritage of faithfulness that they had inherited that was their birthright by their lineage as being a part of the tribe of Levi and the sons of Aaron. And they also, they were bringing dishonor onto God by not following the law in the way that they were supposed to be both worshiping and leading the people in worship. And God is unequivocal. He's very upset with them. He is not okay with what's going on. He wants them to remember who they're supposed to be. So before we get a little bit further into this week, I wanted to, to back up and talk about and remind ourselves about the, the context of what else is going on at the same time Malachi is being written. Malachi is a contemporary, or shortly thereafter, of Ezra and Nehemiah. At this point in time, the nation of Israel has been conquered by the Assyrians, then by the Babylonians, and then by the Persians. Each one of those conquering kingdoms had a different way that they came in and dealt with the people. But by and large, they haven't been in charge of their own destiny from a governmental, from a kingdom perspective for several hundred years. But they get to go back to Israel from Persia. And when they come back, they are rebuilding the temple. That's the story we read about in Ezra. And they are rebuilding the walls around the city. And that's the story we read about there in Nehemiah. But they are not being faithful in worship. They've been gone for hundreds of years, and they're very excited to get back. But very quickly after they get back, they find out, or rather, they demonstrate, that maybe things haven't changed. Maybe they haven't learned their lesson from all the suffering that they've gone through. And they're also not being faithful to their families. We see that in in Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're going to talk about that in more detail uh, today. But, before we get to there, I want to talk about Moses' horns. 
This is a sculpture by Michelangelo. It sits in a basilica, the Basilica of St. Peter in Chains in Rome. And it's part of the tomb of one of the popes that commissioned this, uh, this statue to be built when he was alive. And you see more, Moses has horns. That's not a mistake. It shows up a good bit, especially in, in late medieval art and in early Renaissance art. Where that comes from, there's a man named Jerome. And Jerome is the person who really takes and produces the first widely known, at least, Latin translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's called the Vulgate. And this was used for many, many years in the, in the Catholic Church and in the churches even up to really when the King James gets written in the 1600s. In the Hebrew, the way that you would say the word for radiant or shown or, or something of that nature is very similar to how you would say someone has horns. It's, it's the difference in Q-A-R-A-N in terms of how we would phonetically spell it in Hebrew. It's not quite the same. Versus Q-E-R-E-N. It's very, very similar. The breath marks are the only thing that changed, those vowel sounds that are little marks in the Hebrew. And Jerome just missed it. He messed it up. When he translated this, this is about 400 A.D. Wycliffe, in the 1400s in England, accepts it and puts it in his English translation of the Bible that he makes. So it's around for over a thousand years this mistranslation is. And it ends up being kind of a humorous thing that we can see Moses having horns in, in there. So what I, what I want to say is that with this, translators are human. Translators are not divine. Translators are not inspired. Translators make mistakes. And the translation mistakes may go unmodified, unchallenged for a thousand years. And this is a good example of it. It's a very visual example of it. And so what I want us to do as we open up this passage in Malachi is to take heed lest we fall. I love this quote from Mark Twain. It ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So, I actually had this conversation with Elisha three weeks ago, and he didn't tell me I was going to hit this when I got here. We were talking about divorce. So, church, how does God feel about divorce? He hates it, right? Where do we get that from? We get that from Malachi 2.16. Well, as it turns out, Malachi 2.16 is universally accepted by the translators to be one of the most, if not the most difficult verse to translate in the entire Old Testament. And if we go back and look, New American Standard, the NIV in 84, the New Living Translation, the Revised Standard Version, New King James and Old King James, all will translate it with, I hate divorce. However, the ESV, the NIV 2011, and most ancient translations, including the Septuagint, seem to be pointing that hate somewhere different in a way that very much changes the message of this verse. So this can't really be that hard, right? I mean, why can't the translators just figure it out? So I wanted us to do an object lesson over here real quick in, in English. <laughs> Visiting relatives can be annoying. <laughs> All right, so let's ask the question. Who is visiting? Depends. Who's annoying? That depends too, yeah. We, we can't answer the question from that sentence. Why? It's a simple sentence. We can't answer it. 
Malachi 2.16 in the original language is very much like this sentence. It's not clear who the subject is and who is doing the hating in the original language. Not as clear as, when I visit my family, they annoy me. Or, when I visit my family, I annoy them. It annoys me when my family visits me. I, I, uh, professionally, for a few years in my life, I had a job title where I was called a systems engineer. And for, for engineers in here, what that means, or for those of you who aren't engineers rather, what that means is I was responsible for writing requirements. The product must do this. I learned really quickly that when I thought I was being crystal clear, I was not. And that happened a lot. It was really difficult to write good requirements, requirements that can't be misunderstood and are very precise. Now, I'll give you a, an example of, of this happening just recently within the last month at work. We were dealing with some people in the product organization, and they were leveling a requirement on the product that the requirement was the product couldn't weigh more than 30 pounds. And I know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this. But I asked the question, so if this product was 30 pounds and one ounces, would we cancel the project? And they laughed at me. And they said, no, of course not. And I said, then that's not the requirement, right? Because precise language that can't be misunderstood is difficult. And the context is also important. So what does the speaker want you to think? When we step back out and we have some context, that will help us understand. So if I just came back from a trip across the country to visit my family, and I told you visiting relatives can be annoying, there's context. You would understand that I was annoyed that I had to take a trip. I wish they didn't live all the way across the country. I wish my kids were nicer in the car to each other on the way, you know, whatever the case might be. But you have the context. But if I told you that this was in a Benjamin Franklin aphorism, you might say, well, he might mean this both ways. It could be that he's been purposefully, poetically ambiguous. I appreciate that when, when Bailey, he, he makes comments quite often reminding us that a lot of the Old Testament, when we read it, is poetical. And it can be taken that way, especially the prophets and the Psalms. What I have found, though, looking through commentaries and people who want to translate it with the, the ESV and the NIV, there seems to be a bias to soften the teaching here about divorce. When we read in some of the other English translations that I hate divorce, it's a very strong message. And there's a tendency to soft pedal it. Did the translators have that unconscious bias, or perhaps a conscious bias, trying to soften God's teaching on divorce? Not necessarily. But that's why I think the context is important here. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up and dive a little bit deep into the, the translation differences is because I know a lot of us have different translations and we use different translations. And when we study, we ought to use at least more than one if there's a passage that makes us question something. And so I wanted to make sure that if, if we do see this, we understand some of the context of where it comes from. But I think we can say this, that whichever way the correct translation is, or if God intends us to live in the ambiguity and understand that it really is both ways. Divorce is not something God wants, and it does represent an injustice to the spouse. And this message has often, by God's people, not been received with, with enthusiasm. So we'll let God be his own interpreter here. Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And then in Matthew, along the same lines, he says, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two 
but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this, this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of of the kingdom. This is a message we need to teach our children. Marriage is serious. Divorce is a terrible thing, only to be used as terrible medicine for a terrible situation. And God doesn't guarantee you a healthy romantic relationship as part of your covenant relationship with him and his son. It's not guaranteed. You might only be attracted to people that you can't have a romantic relationship with. Whether that be something that would be homosexuality, whether that would be someone who is in another marriage, whether that be someone who isn't married but doesn't want to marry you. We aren't guaranteed that. And that's okay. And Jesus says we might be called to that life, and some people will be for the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom. How'd I do, Elisha? Did we cover that okay? Yes, Adam. <clears throat> Think about divorce in the context of Malachi. It draws me to Haggai. Mm. Because God is speaking to Haggai about his people because it's a heart problem. His heart is all, marriage is all about <coughs> heart. They thought more of themselves than they did of God. In building their home, the temple, it was all about themselves. In marriage, you look at the same way. The man thinks more, more about himself than he does the relationship that God has established for him. <coughs> and so it's a heart thing. No matter what you look at, it's all heart. There, there is a selfishness that these Jewish men are exhibiting. That God is rejecting. Absolutely. So let's turn over to our passage for this morning, Malachi 2, and let's read verses 10 through 16. We're going to read the whole passage all at once, and we'll, we'll step back and ask ourselves some questions and have some discussion about what Malachi wants the Jews to know and what God wants us to know. So Malachi chapter 2, verses 10. Hey, if you're curious, I'm, I'm going to be reading out of the 1984 NIV is what I have. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, May the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. 
I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. What covenants are considered here? What are the covenants that Malachi is calling them to remember? Okay? So he's calling them to remember the law itself, right? He's calling them to remember, well, the the very core of their religious experience. Absolutely. What else? Okay. So Adam reminds us that marriage is not just a covenant between two people. Marriage is a covenant between individuals and God as well. And so it's, it's a bit of a triangle, isn't it? Is you do have a covenant with each other, but a husband has a covenant with God and a wife has a covenant with God. And there is obligation. What else? What other covenants are here? Works of the flesh. So they are very much concerned with something that's not spiritual here. There's no spiritual reason for them to be destroying their marriages. Yeah, they do. They need to, when, when God says he creates one, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? There, there's, there's a visual there, and I, I think it somewhat uh, points back to, to the sexual relationship, but there's also very much that one purpose that we have. That one, if, if we're in this, we're really in this together. It's, it's me and my wife, we're on the team against the world. She's the only person that I'm concerned about, uh, you know, really, she's my teammate like that. I don't have another relationship that even comes close to that. Your individual covenant with God or even your marriage covenant with God, it doesn't matter how many sacrifices you bring to try to justify yourself. He he rejects them. Yeah. What if we have a really good reason? It's like, well, I've, I've got a good reason. It reminds me of Saul. King Saul, when he's told to go and destroy the Amalekites, he decides, well, I'd really like to bring some things back to sacrifice. That seems like a good thing, right? We we make love an idol. We can make love an idol. Well, God wants me to have a loving marriage, and my marriage isn't loving. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to go find another marriage. God, I I believe God does want us to have a loving marriage, but I believe he wants us to find it in the one we're in, not in another one. How are those covenants being broken? Like literally, what what, what are they doing? Let's let's think about this. They're, They're described as they're marrying the daughters of foreign gods. What does that mean? What's that mean, Ann? Yeah, the context, especially bringing back in what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah, seems to strongly indicate the second, is that the people of Israel divorcing their Jewish wives. Like you're backstabbing God again. 
Well, it's a very formal sort of book, too. <laughs> When something on your lawn. And divorce is more the second one. It takes preparation. Yes. Yeah, this is this is this may start as passion, but it's not a crime of passion by the time you get to divorce. This is calculated. Yeah. yeah. That's an adulterous affair there. Yeah, while, while living in open rebellion. Yes. And it is open. Because, again, not that it will be any better, but it's different. It's not a, it's not a secret affair. This is a legal matter that must be handled before the community. This is public. It's very public. In, in a way, it's, it's somewhat analogous to what Paul deals with with the Corinthian church, where this man is just parading around with his father's wife. He's public about it. He's not ashamed. That's a big part of the reason that Paul, I think, is so, if you will, strong with his reaction about what the Corinthians need to do with that man. They're supposed to cut him off, don't even eat with him, because he's acting like everything's okay, and it's clearly not. And that's the same thing the Jews are doing here as well. So let's ask ourselves this question. Why are these men doing this? Why are they doing this? This isn't a secret affair. It's not purely passion. Why would they be doing this? What do you think, Jack? Well, one of the reasons it started happening is because when God told them to go into Canaan, the land of Canaan, and destroy all of these nations, they didn't destroy all of those nations. And they started marrying the people that they left alive and worshiping their gods. I think there's a lesson for us there in that God's plans don't always make sense to us at the moment. How many of us have ever looked back at something our parents told us and like, yeah, I really should have listened to them because now I understand what they were saying. It's the same kind of thing. God had a plan and they didn't execute on it and they suffered for it to the time of Malachi. Yeah. When something I've thought of a lot. You know, it boils down to selfishness and what we all will tend to do is begin a sentence with the two words, I think. I think. Because we're taking God out of the equation and doing it ourselves, doing it our way. And I think that's what happened there, like with not destroying all the nations. They, somebody said, I think we should Leave some of these nations alone. There you go. It's Saul again. It's, I think this will be a good idea to bring these sacrifices back. I think this will be a good idea. God would be happy with this, I think. When, when Jesus speaks, he often says, have you not read? Or, it is written. That is a very different way to begin. And, and he can speak however he wants to, with authority. We would do well to follow that pattern. Now, it may be hard to avoid, so this is written, and I think this is what it means. But that's different than saying, I think this without the basis of it being written. Yeah? I feel like what you said about authority is important. Like, what they did by not destroying those nations was because of weak leadership. Because God said, okay, you want a leader, we'll give you an inferior one, basically. One that looks nice and is tall and everything, but is not really strong. And now they've made it, and because that leader couldn't control the entire nation, mm -hmm. you can see the choices that his individual people made were not ones that aligned with God's interests or their own interests. So in this, he's saying, all right, I'm not going to, if you don't want me to be a leader at all, involved at all, then I won't be. Even the contract I've made with your priests is 
and we very much see that you know, God set out a certain way with the judges, especially, and with the law, that they were to be ruled. They didn't like God's plan. God sets out a plan for these men for their marriages in the law in Deuteronomy that they're supposed to keep their marriages inside the kingdom, inside the nation of Israel. And they don't like that plan. I wonder if this is a status thing. I wonder if this is they're marrying to move on up. Because maybe they've, they've come back and they've brought their Jewish wives, but some of the women in power and authority in this area might have been women who were brought in from other places by the other kingdoms. They might be these Gentile women. They may be looking to move up in the world uh, for whatever reason. Um, and it may also be that they're younger women because we read here that they're leaving the wife of their youth. And so you get this sense that they're leaving their wives now that their wives are older. It may be that they're past childbearing years and the man wants to continue to have children. Whatever it is, he's looking for some sort of advantage, whether it be just the, the physical lust or whether it be some sort of money or position advantage. It is unjust what these men are doing to their wives. Yeah, Keith. Well, that or all being loved. That's true. Now, he, he does pivot back a little bit. Yeah. And he, he's pointing, so he's been talking to the priest, but now he seems to be talking more broadly. But who do you think is involved in granting divorces? That's a good point. The priest star. Yes. And so, again, the, the priests are involved. They might be the perpetrators, but they're also, once again, they're probably involved in the paperwork, if you will, going along with this. And they could put a stop to it. All right, so we've talked some about this. What are the consequences of the broken covenants? You see the broken families, but you also see that their worship, their sacrifice, they're living in open defiance. God says, don't come over here and cry and boo-hoo to me. You're weeping. I'm not listening to you because you're not seriously taking your covenants to each other. Yes, Mr. Bill. They had guilt causing the weeping. They knew it was wrong. They did it anyway. And now they have the consequences of living with that. And people today even have guilt of the consequences of doing the same thing. Yeah. So that and very much is that there are these consequences that are following them. You can imagine at the time of Ezra and Malachi and, and Nehemiah here, these men have been in these marriages. There may be children now from both families. What are you going to do? There's no, there's no clean solution. Maybe there's a holy solution, but there's not a clean solution. Yeah, Tom? Yeah, but they're trying to solve the problem incorrectly. They're trying to solve it by giving sacrifices mm. to God to pay homage or pay for whatever they've done. In other words, I'm doing this because I did this because I don't want to change. I like this. Yeah. I want to continue to do this. And God's rejected them. Uh, rejecting that sacrifice. You have to change. You have to go back to your things that are to your life and your youth. I, I, you keep reminding me of, of Saul and Samuel. You know, Samuel says, does, does the Lord delight in sacrifice? No. He wants you to obey the voice of the Lord. Sometimes obedience means you might have to roll something back. You might have to change the way that you think about something or the way you've structured your life. That is possible. Yes, Adam? Remember in Ezra, when the people came out of the battle, <coughs> Persia, going back to the promised land, many of the Levites, Wrong with 
Absolutely. And they, they haven't fixed their problems. They need to. But it's a tough thing to fix this problem. Does God say, well, I understand it's hard on you guys, so you know, do better next time? He doesn't give them an out like that. He calls them back to holiness. So why do you think God cares so much about the marriages of his people here? Why does he care so much? What was he looking for? He's looking for spiritual offspring. That's what he tells us, right? And what, what do we think that means in the context of the Old Testament here? It's a little more clear. He's looking for his people to remain, remain pure. We look at the history of David and Solomon, and we see their wives drug them away. All the kings that we read about in 1 Kings, so many of them are drug away by their covenant marriage relationships. Men like Ahab um, are, are dragged away by their, their strong wives with their, their pagan background. And they don't, they don't lift them up. They let those marriage relationships bring them down. Didn't work out so well for him, did it? All, all these wives, yeah, it, it absolutely didn't. So I think one thing I, I wanted to, to point out here, there's, there's this word that is used, it's, it's, a, it's a legal term. You hear that people get divorced and they say, I have irreconcilable differences, right? I have an irreconcilable difference as well with God. I can't reconcile that. I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't have, I don't have the, the money to pay that debt with. I don't have the right kind of credit. But sacrifice from him overcomes that irreconcilable difference. And he paid that sacrifice. He paid it. When we consider our marriage relationships and the marriage relationships of people in our lives, we may see some people that have irreconcilable differences. You may think with your spouse you have irreconcilable differences. Maybe you do. But you can overcome them with sacrifice. And you might say it's not fair that I have to sacrifice because my spouse is the problem. And whoever you are, you are definitely probably right about that. And again, I said that with ambiguity because it works both ways, right? But was it fair that Jesus had to come and be crucified because you and I can't control ourselves? No. No, it's not fair. And did God pay it anyway gladly? He did. Because we, as his children, we as his church, are in a covenant relationship. These men here, they weren't willing to make whatever sacrifice they needed to keep their families together. Yes, Sarah. is that each side of these relationships had either one, there was, a, there was an imbalance in voice, because I mean, if you think about it culturally, marriages weren't arranged between the two partners, they were arranged by the parents. Mm -hmm. So love in marriage was supposed to grow from the marriage onward, it was not necessary beforehand. So we're coming at this from a purely modern, purely Western culture mindset. But the fact is that, you know, for us, we have, well, we start out in love with each other and people so easily fall out of love because they don't put the, the time, the sacrifice, the effort into cultivating the love that they start out with. The marriage first, love afterwards, generally speaking, gave those opportunities, but here we're seeing that they also were not taking the opportunities to cultivate those relationships and make it grow from something that started out, what, you know, whether they were willing for it or not, mm -hmm. to something that could have been supporting and mutually beneficial. Yes. So that kind of leads into what I wanted to, to finish up with here. <laughs> What should men and women who are married be doing, both then and now? What should we be doing? They should be serving the Lord. 
first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And if these men were focused on their covenant relationship with God, they wouldn't have had the question about breaking their covenant relationship with their wives. That is their most important relationship, and that is their most important covenant, is with God. And because they're breaking one, they're breaking the other. And the two are linked. The two are linked. When, when, they, when Jesus asked, or is asked, what the greatest commandments are, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. So which one of those can you do? Can you just do the first one and, well, that's the most important one and I won't worry about the other one? No, it doesn't work. It's like the whole discussion about faith and works. Yes, you're saved by faith, but a faith that saves isn't a live faith. It's, it's a working faith. They go together. And if you love God, you will love your neighbor. And if you love God, you will love your spouse if you have one. What should we be doing? Not necessarily in our marriage relationships, but let's back up. As the kingdom of God, as God's children, what should we be doing in light of this passage in Malachi? What does he say he's going to do with these people who are breaking faith in their marriage covenants? He's going to cut them off. Do we have a responsibility for that? We have a responsibility given to us in the New Testament to hold each other accountable. Yeah, the first thing we need to do is we need to bear each other's burdens. And it is a difficult thing at times to be married. I know it's difficult at times to be married to me. Yeah, she's, she's agreeing, yeah. <laughs> and so we need to help each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to share our lives and our stories with each other because they can help. We shouldn't draw boxes around ourselves, but we should also challenge each other. If we know a man or we know a woman in the church that is thinking about or acting about to violate their covenant relationship with their spouse, it can't be one of those things that we are cautious about. We need to attack it and say, no, you can't do that. What can I do to support you? This is not okay. Let's bring somebody in to help you. Let's talk. Let's be together. This is not an okay thing. The church is supposed to be loving, but many times the love that we need might not always be gentle, and it might not always be affirming, and that's okay. God isn't affirming He's not casting them out and saying, you guys aren't my children anymore. He's saying, you're my children and you're being knuckleheads. And he wants them to do better. And we should all be doing better with each other and supporting each other. So next week we'll pick up right here. Malachi is going to give us some prophecy. He's, he's been calling the people out, but he's going to start pointing to the future and he's going to talk about what is coming next? And we're going to start to get an aroma of the New Testament, if you will. So I want you to read this passage if you have time this week. But also start to think about Malachi has been saying these are all the problems we're having. But God is going to offer a way back. And he does it maybe in an interesting way that you wouldn't think. The first thing that he calls them back to. And so we'll pick up here next week. Thank you very much for your attention and bless me to mercy.